speaker to the stage for Young Communicators. Good morning, 4.30! How's everybody doing out there? It is so great to be here with you guys today. Uh, if we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Evan, and I get the honor and the privilege of serving on our chapel kids team here at the chapel. And we just had one of our biggest events. It is our VBS. We did dive in. Uh, can I hit you guys with a few numbers? Uh, we had 850 plus kids. We had 300 plus volunteers. We had two separate VBS events here at the chapel. We had one at Chapel in Richmond. Can we give a hand to everybody that made that possible? Our kids volunteers are the best around. So thank you, thank you, thank you. It is my favorite team here. So kids ministry, we love it. Uh, speaking of kids ministry, our kids director at Chapel Mosley, his name is Jack, and he is one of my really good friends. And the other day, uh, like a month ago, he texted me with audacity and said, hey, would you love to go see all three Lord of the Rings extended editions in theaters with me oh, like over the course of a weekend? Now, if you don't know, all three extended editions, Lord of the Rings, that's like 13 hours of movies. <laughs> and I just didn't know. Like, that's three days. That's 13 hours in a theater. That's crazy. But I love Jack, so I said... Yeah, I would love to go. So I'm sitting there seeing these movies on the big screen for the first time in my life, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so epic. I want to be like Aragorn, the king that is returning to take the throne and defeat this darkness. He has so much courage. I want to be like Samwise Gamgee. He's such a good friend of Frodo, and he goes all the way to Mount Doom, even when he probably should have turned back on day one. And I want to be like a cool wizard like Gandalf, just because he's a cool wizard. <laughs> uh, but with all these really amazing and good and wonderful characters, I think uh, sometimes I can view myself as Gollum. Yeah. <laughs> Sad. In case you didn't know from the Oz, like Gollum is like this tragic character who finds the ring a long time ago and he gets corrupted by it. His name was Smeagol. Now he's Gollum. He's like fallen into darkness and all he wants is this ring. And the director, Peter Jackson, does some amazing work when he's shooting some scenes. He'll do something and Gollum's sitting by a lake by himself and it'll cut and he'll be like, I'm Gollum. I'm Smeagol. I want to kill the hobbitses. I want to help the hobbitses. It's a whole thing. And I think sometimes I feel more like Gollum, just torn in two and divided. One part longing for everything that God has for me, and the other part just pulled by those selfish desires of just whatever the day is bringing. And it's, it's not a great feeling sometimes. But it makes me look to the word of God. And in the story of Ezekiel, He's this prophet, and Israel is currently divided as a nation. And there's the northern land that is Israel and the southern land that is Judah, and they are divided. They're not one anymore like God has intended. So God is going to give Ezekiel a message. He says, all right, take two sticks and write on these sticks. One side, say Judah and the Israelites therein, and on the other side, say for Joseph or Ephraim, and this is to represent Israel. And then... Take these two sticks and I want you to hold them together in your hand and then I'm going to make them one. And he says, Ezekiel, when people see you holding this stick, they're going to be like, what is going on? So here's what you tell them in Ezekiel 37, 20 through 23. Hold before their eyes the stick you have written on and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nation where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back to their own land. I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all of them, and they will never again be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any of the other offenses, for I will save them from all their sinful backsliding, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be, your, uh, I will be their God. Now, 
we can often see ourselves in the nation of Israel. They kind of mess up a lot. We definitely mess up a lot. So I see this verse and I'm like, God, how can I put myself back together? I feel divided. I feel pulled in two. How can I do it? What can I do? How hard can I pray? How hard can I try? I, me, Evan. That's not what the verse is going at. It's not what it's saying. So I'm going to take some chunks out of here and just, just read them for you. This is God speaking. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back. I will make them one nation. I will save them from all their backsliding, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. So even though I want to fix everything, it's still this golem, selfish mindset of what can I do? How can I fix it? What can I strive for? So then you turn your mind and say, God, what can you do? And where do I need to put myself? And I think he gives the answer to King Solomon in 2 Chronicles after he's built the temple. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, God is telling Solomon this. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. This is not a verse that says we have to come whole to God. This is not a verse that says we have to come put together and fully functioning and fully like ready to go. This is a verse that says we can humble ourselves, look at our king and sit under him and we can give him our sticks. These six that say broken, these six that say addicted, these six that say messed up, these six that say no good to us, God can take those sticks, all of them once, hold them in his hand, and put them back together. And now the sticks that Ezekiel was holding, it didn't say that it got erased Judah and Israel. But through the lens of God's grace and glory, it tells a story of his power. It tells a story of his majesty and his might. So we can try all we want. But the act of being made whole is not about what we've done or what we could possibly do. It's about letting God in, submitting ourselves to the only one who can hold those sticks together and letting him have all that we are. Chapel, thank you so much. What's up, Chapel? How we doing? Can we honor Evan one more time? Evan's been such a great friend to me. I've enjoyed his wisdom over the years that I've known him. Um, my name is Rebecca. Nice to meet you. Um, I have the amazing opportunity of serving on a few of our incredible teams here at the chapel. Um, I just recently graduated from VCU about two months ago. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, and I'm undergoing some pretty major life transitions. Um, I accepted a job and will be moving in a month to Newport News um, to be a campus minister with InterVarsity, um, which is an organization that plants Christian communities on college campuses. Um, and I'll be at Christopher Newport University sharing the good news of Jesus with college students um, and discipling them towards a better relationship with Jesus. Thank you. I'm very excited. I am thrilled and eager to be there um, as I believe that this is what the Lord is truly calling me to. Um, and I'm also so scared of the newness of it all. Um, but so the Lord has prompted me to share with you all one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Um, and one of the passages that I've been praying over and over again as I prepare to go serve him and his kingdom. So... If you have your Bible or an app on your phone, turn with me to Psalm 27. To give you a little context, Psalm 27 was written by David. Some think that he wrote it while fleeing from Saul, who was trying to kill him in an attempt to prevent him from being king. Um, but the true timeline of this psalm is actually unknown. Um, but it was definitely written in the midst of some trial. Okay, I know it's a little long. The clock is already ticking, so let's jump in together. I'm about to throw a lot of scripture at you. Are you ready? Incredible, let's do it. Um, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. 
Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I will remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Whew. I love this psalm so much. It's a beautiful picture of David saying, Lord, I just want to spend my whole life worshiping you. I want to do the same. As I've been navigating these life transitions, there's been so much fear that's crept into my mind. Am I going to find good community where I'm going? Am I going to be good at this job? Are the college students going to like me? Am I going to have friends? The Lord has been challenging me with that first verse. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I love here that the Lord is described as the light. In fact, this is the only time in the Old Testament where, the, where that word is used to describe God. John 1 uses light to describe Jesus multiple times. What a cool parallel. David also describes God as his strength. If God is his light and his strength, who can be against him? We have nothing to fear if the Lord our God is our light and our strength, our true salvation. If he is your guide and you are truly seeking his will in everything that you do, then there is nothing to fear. How freeing is that? Verse three says, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. I don't know what that army might be for you. Maybe it's marital issues or parenting trouble or some other battle that you're facing. My army is sometimes under the guise of depression or anxiety or the desire to be perfect. But because the Lord is our light and our strength and our salvation, none of these enemies stand a chance. Our hearts will not fear when war breaks out against us. We will be confident in the Lord our God. My favorite verse in this whole passage is verse four. One thing I ask for, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. This verse has long been my prayer. There have been, been many days where this has been my cry. I distinctly remember one day about two semesters ago where I broke down because of how chaotic of a life I was living. I had a ton of extracurricular responsibilities that I took very seriously on top of all the academics and perfect grades I was trying to achieve. I was having quiet times, um, but they were rushed and inauthentic. I was just doing it to check the box on the long list of to-do um, things that needed to be done each day. Um, and I met with the woman, the woman who was discipling me that day, and I just sobbed to her. Um, all I wanted to do was sit at the feet of Jesus. I just wanted to bask in his presence and be held. This verse was my request to the Lord. David is asking to just dwell in the house of the Lord. The Hebrew word for dwell here means to sit down, to remain, to settle, or to marry. He wants to settle in and remain in the presence of the Lord, together forever, no separation. The Hebrew for ask also translate to beg. His zeal and fervency is palpable. This is his one true desire, this is his cry. There's only one thing that he could ask for for the remainder of his life and seek after. It would be to remain in the presence of the Lord. The Lord has convicted me with this verse countless times. Where are my priorities? Is this my one true desire? Am I begging this of him? And I'd love to ask the same questions of you. Where are your priorities? Is this your one true desire? Are you begging this of him? 
This passage ends in a triumphant statement of faith and serves as a reminder to David and to all of us. Verse 13, I will remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. David is confident that the Lord is good and that he is good now amidst his current trial and God will be good in the trials David has yet to face. David understands that the Lord's goodness is not circumstantial, but rather is his identity. The Lord is good. I can get so wrapped up in my circumstances and how terrible life seems at any given moment um, that I completely lose sight of this fact. God is always good. I want to be more like David in this respect, and I pray that we can grow more confident of this truth. God is good, and we can see it now. Then David tells us to wait for the Lord. He's encouraging us to humbly submit everything to his will. Submit those battles that are breaking out in your family. Submit your frightening finances and bills, and you submit your relationships. As, Lord is the light, as long as the Lord is our light and our strength and our salvation, what do we have to fear? We simply must submit, be patient, and continue to seek his face while in the waiting. There's so many more things I could say about this passage, and I'm already out of time, um, and there's just simply not enough time in the world. Um, so I want to encourage you to read this passage again for yourself and dive deeper into it. I'm praying for you to fully submit to him. I'm praying that dwelling in the Lord's house and gazing upon his beauty becomes your one most deepest desire. I'm praying that we can remain confident that the Lord is good. May the Lord be merciful to you and lead you toward his will. Thank you. Rebecca, excellent, uh, excellent job. Evan, you too. I am so excited for what the Lord is going to do through you uh, at Christopher Newport. Um, and I'm really excited to see you uh, lean into that calling that he has for you. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Mike. Uh, I have the privilege of serving on a couple teams here, but uh, the one I like the most, uh, sorry to the Chapel Kids team and to the other teams, but uh, I get to serve on our students team here. Um, you, you heard about Motion Conference. Um, if you have a teenager, they need to be there. Uh, there is no better opportunity for them to experience the transforming power of a relationship with Jesus than in this room when it's 95 degrees at the end of July. So please get them here. If you don't have a teenager, congratulations, you survived, or maybe you're not there yet like we are. Um, but I also would encourage you to spend some time with them because God is moving in absolutely incredible ways. And the opportunity to be even a small part of that is so humbling for me. But, uh, you know, as I started to think about what the Lord uh, would have me share with you today, I was kind of all over the place. I was really excited. Uh, and for those of you that know me, this won't be a surprise. I was also terrified. Um, even as I stand here right now, I feel wholly inadequate. Um, but the Lord has reminded me of something over and over again. And it's something I want to share with you. And it's that there is no better place to be than right next to Jesus. And so the passage I'm going to uh, share with you today is James chapter 4, uh, verses 8 through 10. Most of you are probably familiar with the beginning of this, but there's more to the story than just the first half of the first verse. So it says, come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. So there are three things in this passage. They all start with P. I'm a pretty simple guy. I like alliteration. Uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about is the promise. The second thing that we're going to talk about is the perspective. And then the third thing that we're going to talk about is the purpose. So the promise is really clear. Draw near to the Lord, and he will draw near to you. Sounds great, right? I'm all for that. But it's not a promise that your life will be easy. In fact, Jesus reminds us that in this world, we will have troubles. 
right? So it's not a get out of jail free card. It's not a solve all your problems card. In fact, I believe that Jesus doesn't want to solve all our problems immediately. He wants to transform us in them, right? And so while it may not be an easy button, what it is is an invitation for something much better. It's an invitation to a relationship with the one who has overcome the world. And it's an opportunity for us to experience the power of the Holy Spirit that can overcome things that we can never overcome on our own. I have a toddler, right? He's in the middle of potty training. And so for those of you that have done that, you know that, that being close to something or proximity is a good thing, right? I want him near the toilet. But if we don't finish the process, proximity enough is not enough, right? But an interesting thing happens. As we begin to change our position, right? So as I change my position on this stage, and let's pretend Jesus is over here. Well, now my perspective has changed. So my perspective of this room is different because I've changed my position, right? And so the second half of verse 8 and verse 9, I think, really drive this home. It reminds us, right, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided. And it goes on to continue to remind us that we should be sad about our, our human condition. And it's, it's not an easy thing, because as we go, grow closer to Jesus, we're reminded of our own brokenness. We're reminded of our inadequacy. We're reminded of all of the times that we failed and come up short and not lived up to the calling that he's put on our life. And that can be really hard. Um, so if you're at a place where you don't know how you feel about Jesus or you feel like, ah, you know, Mike, you don't know me. It's too much. You're never too far away from him. And so as we, as we grow closer to him and as we begin to grasp our own brokenness and our own, our own fallenness, it does something really interesting. And I think about my own life. My wife and I are in the middle of a season, um, quite frankly, that's been really hard. But as we've, as we've leaned into what Jesus has for us, you know, and we wrestle with our own inability to solve it, you know, it's allowed us to experience that, that power of the Holy Spirit, right? And it's changed our perspective. So all the places where we've seen failure and disappointment, et cetera, et cetera, we now begin to see him. And even though he hasn't solved the problem, we can so clearly see him working in our life that how could we not continue to draw near to him even in the midst of our, of our challenges, right? And as you do that, as you begin to shift your perspective and die to yourself, it allows the Holy Spirit to work and it allows the Holy Spirit to fulfill the purpose, right? Which is the third P. And the purpose is that as you humble yourself before the Lord, as you change your perspective of yourself and change your perspective of who he is and put him in his rightful place, it does something really cool. You begin to bear fruit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. I don't know about you. There has never been a time in my life where those things, I didn't need more of them, right? And my highest highs and my lowest lows, bearing fruit, that fruit is is better than any solution I could ever come up with for myself, right? But I've got even better news than that. It's not just about the short term. It's not about solving the problem that's in front of you. When he says, I will lift you up in honor, that's an eternal promise. So even beyond just the day-to-day -day challenges uh, that the fruits of the Spirit can help us overcome, when you leave this world and you're seated before the Lord, he wants to see his son instead of you. He doesn't want to see your shortcomings and your failures and all of that. That's, that's what you see. That's what I see when I look in the mirror. He will see his son. And all it requires is that we, we draw near to him and we fix our perspective, right? And we put him in his rightful place. And so whether today is the best day of your life or the worst, I just want to encourage you to draw near to Jesus. Remember his promise Fix your perspective and embrace his purpose for your life because his purpose for you is far greater than anything you could ever imagine for yourself. So I love you guys. Thanks for the opportunity. Have a great rest of the day. And uh,
Wow, can we thank our team one more time? I also just wanna encourage you um, to check out this morning's messages online. They have been just so good, so encouraging, so inspiring. So be sure to check those out. Um, it is not easy, but they make it look easy. Um, I, I know because I'm standing right here right now. And uh, I also just wanna bring honor to our pastors. They do this week in and week out. Um, thank you so much for this awesome opportunity. Yeah. Uh, if we haven't met personally yet, my name is Emma Julian, and I get to serve here on our creative team. I also get to serve alongside my husband, KJ, with Chapel Students. Um, we have a daughter named Celia. She just turned two last week, and uh, like Mike, um, I'm learning a lot about toddlers, okay? Toddlers, um, they're like Sour Patch Kids, right? First they're sour, then they're sweet. One moment, she's so cuddly and, oh, I love you, mommy. And then the next minute, something comes over her tiny body and there's like a full meltdown of epic proportions. And um, here's the thing, I see myself in her sometimes and not just as her mom and a former toddler, but as an adult too, we can kind of like get thrown off. We can get grumpy and grumble when things don't go our way or when routines change. And um, just like her, we kind of learn to grow and pass through these experiences, but it can be really tempting to want to keep things comfortable for her, right? So sometimes I just want to give into the temper tantrum just to kind of like keep the peace, but as, my, uh, as her parent, I'm kind of learning that my role is not really to do that. My role is to really help her uh, grow and develop. I'm helping her navigate those sour moments and really appreciate and savor those sweet moments. And um, I need her to trust me as I lead, and then we're doing that through experience. And just like a child might kind of need a gentle push to explore something new, I really think that we need God's guidance to help us step outside of our comfort zones so that we can experience all that God has for us. Uh, and I think comfort zones lull us into a false sense of security anyway. They kind of make us think that everything is okay just because there's no immediate conflict, but God has so much more for us than a comfortable life. And I'm gonna say that again. God has so much more for us than a comfortable life. And if we're truly aligned with his promises, we need to keep moving forward and not get stuck right where we are. And this is where the story of Lot's wife comes to mind. And I know it's kind of an obscure story, right? We don't know much about her. Um, her written story is really brief and we don't even really know, we don't know her name, but Jesus tells us to remember her. And that itself is significant because the only other person we're told to remember in scripture is Jesus himself. So in Luke 17, 28 through 33, Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. So before I set the scene for you, I wanna dismiss anybody who's getting baptized. We're so excited to celebrate them in just a few minutes. Um, and because I have such limited time, I wanna warn you that um, it's about to get real, real quick with this passage of scripture, okay? This is Genesis 19, and this is gonna be right as the angels are leading Lot's family out of the city, and it's about to be destroyed by God for its wickedness. The scripture says, when Lot hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. And as soon as they brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives, don't look back, and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. And then in verse 26, and I like this amplified version, says, but Lot's wife from behind him foolishly and longingly looked back towards Sodom in an act of disobedience and she became a pillar of salt. So Lot and his family are fleeing a city infamous for its sinfulness, right? But it was a place of familiarity and comfort for Lot's wife, right? She was settled, she was privileged, she was wealthy, but she was without a good community, and so it was easy to see how her connection with God faded really quickly. That's because life without trouble often makes us forget the source of our peace. And we often see this story as a lesson in obedience because the only thing that we know about Lot's wife was that she was told one thing. She was told, don't look back. And the one thing she was told not to do is exactly what she did. Remember, I have a toddler, so I have a lot of experience with this. 
Um, but it's also about how she did it. So when the angels urged them to leave the city, she looked back not just out of curiosity, but really out of a longing to go back and live the life that she once had. Because fear of the unknown can keep us rooted in the familiar, even if it's unhealthy and even if it's unfulfilling. And it might seem easy at first to judge Lot's wife for what she's done, but it's, the reality is, is that our own hearts don't always demonstrate a preference for Jesus above all. Sometimes we turn away from him to look back at other longings. And sometimes we desire to preserve the things that he's asked us to let go of. So when Jesus asks us to remember Lot's wife, how do we do that? How do we leave the past and our comfort zones behind so that we can move forward in faith? And the first thing I wanna share is to keep our eyes up. Lot's wife had her eyes on the wrong prize. She worshiped her own comfort, which led to disbelief and then disobedience. So we have to be able to lift our gaze off of ourselves and off of our own immediate desires so that we can truly see all that God has for us. Number two is to keep our hearts open. So we have to have our hearts checked by God daily. And I love Psalm 51.10, which asks God to create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. And I think this is so important because it helps us from getting too comfortable with ourselves just the way that we are. We really need the Lord's help to help identify areas in our lives where we're pursuing and prioritizing our own comfort instead of pursuing righteousness. And then lastly, keep it moving. Um, Lot's wife was already on her way to safety when she turned and looked around. So she was already halfway to her new life when she stopped. So we have to keep going. We have to keep trusting. We have to keep putting one foot in front of the other. And for some of us, that might look like joining us for church when you're comfortable in your PJs at home. It might look like going to your small group when you've had a long day and the house is a complete wreck. It might look like going to motion night when none of your friends are going that night or when it's easier just not to show up. But even when you can't fully see the path forward, you have to keep moving because you don't know what God has for you on the other side of your comfort. Faith, Hebrew says, is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see, which means that faith is always pointed towards the future. And I think this is what Jesus meant when he urged us to remember Lot's wife, that we have to keep our eyes, we have to keep our hearts, and we have to keep our steps directed towards him. So will you stand with me? We're about to have the opportunity to respond and worship. And like I said, we're gonna get to celebrate those who have decided to take their next steps in faith through baptism. But first, I wanna pray for you. So God, we lift our eyes off the things of this world, off our circumstances and off ourselves. Keep us from looking back, from getting stuck, and give us the grace to look forward to the eternal things to come. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.